questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello? Oh, hello. I'm ringing about the advertisement in yesterday's newspaper, the one for the bookcases. Can you tell me if they're still available? We've sold one, but we still have two available. Right. Um, can you tell me a bit about them? Sure. Um, what do you want to know? Well, I'm looking for something to fit in my study. So, well, I'm not too worried about the height, but the width's quite important. Can you tell me how wide each of them is? They're both exactly the same size. Let me see. I've got the details written down somewhere. Yes, so they're both 75 centimetres wide and 180 centimetres high. OK, fine. That should fit in OK. And I don't want anything that looks too severe. Not made of metal, for example. I was really looking for something made of wood. That's all right. They are, both of them. So are they both the same price as well? No, the first bookcase is quite a bit cheaper. It's just £15. We paid £60 for it just five years ago, so it's very good value. It's in perfectly good condition. Well, they're both in very good condition, in fact. But the first one isn't the same quality as the other one. It's a good sturdy bookcase. It used to be in my son's room, but it could do with... A fresh coat of paint. Oh, it's painted? Yes, it's cream at present. But as I say, you could easily change that if you wanted to fit in with your colour scheme. Yes, I'd probably paint it white if I got it. Let's see, what else? How many shelves has it got? Six. Two of them are fixed and the other four are adjustable so you can shift them up and down according to the sizes of your books. Right, fine. Well, that certainly sounds like a possibility. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. But the second one's a lovely bookcase, too. That's not painted. It's just the natural wood colour, dark brown. It was my grandmother's, and I think she bought it sometime in the 1930s. So I'd say it must be getting on for 80 years old. So it's very good quality. They don't make them like that nowadays. And you said it's the same dimensions as the first one? Yes, and it's got the six shelves. But it also has a cupboard at the bottom that's really useful for keeping odds and ends in. Right. Oh, and I nearly forgot to say, the other thing about it is it's got glass doors, so the books are all kept out of the dust. So it's really good value for the money. I'm really sorry to be selling it, but we just don't have the room for it. Hmm. So what are you asking for that one? £95. It's quite a bit more... But it's a lovely piece of furniture. A real heirloom. Yes. All the same, it's a lot more than I wanted to pay. I didn't really want to go above 30 or 40. Anyway, the first one sounds fine for what I need. Just as you like. So, is it all right if I come round and have a look this evening? Then, if it's OK, I can take it away with me. Of course. So, you'll be coming by car, will you? I've got a friend with a van, so I'll get him to bring me round. If you can just give me the details of where you live. Sure. I'm Mrs Blake. B-L-A-K-E. That's right. And the address is 41 Oak Rise. That's in Stanton. OK. So I'll be coming from the town centre. Can you give me an idea of where you are? Yes. You know the road that goes out towards the university? Yes. Well, you take that road and you go on till you get to a roundabout. Go straight on, then Oak Rise is the first road to the right. Out towards the university, past the roundabout, first left. First right. And we're at the end of the road. Got it. So I'll be round at about seven, if that's all right. 
Oh, and um, my name's Connor. Connor Field. Fine. I'll see you then, Connor. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, I'm Steve Pinfold and I'm here today to tell you about my gap year, which I took about 20 years ago. Unlike many students these days who go travelling or get some work experience between school and university, I decided to do something completely different after finishing my degree. I applied to work for a charity organisation. What it does is it sends people with particular skills to countries where those skills are needed. Apart from having some experience teaching English to summer school students, I didn't have any particularly useful skills, I thought, but luckily I was still accepted. I had to find the money for the flight, but you get free accommodation, I stayed with a family of five. And you do get paid, but not much. It's a bit like pocket money, enough to get by. I worked in an orphanage and taught English at a local school. Where was I? Well, originally, I was going to be sent to a village in India, but at the last minute, the organisation decided to send me to Trinidad. Now, this is a fascinating place. It's an island in the Caribbean. Well, in fact, the country is actually two islands. The smaller one is called Tobago, which is connected somehow to the word tobacco. Anyway, there I was, a young white guy living and working on an island which is mostly a mixture of descendants from Africa and India. The Africans were originally brought over as slaves, and the Indians came later as indentured workers. That means they agreed to come for a specific time, but many of them stayed. There are also some Trinidadians of Chinese and British origin, though the native inhabitants were basically wiped out by colonialization. I myself felt completely accepted and had the time of my life. The language everyone speaks is English, so there was no problem for me there, but some concepts don't quite translate. They're pure Trinidadian. There's the term liming, for example, which means sitting around watching the world go by. Also, there's the famous carnival, when the whole island is taken up in playing mass. For a whole month, around February or March, it depends when Easter is, Everyone's busy preparing costumes, practicing calypsos, soca and steel pan music, and most importantly, partying. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. When the actual official carnival starts, it's days of 24-hour dancing in the streets. In Trinidad, it's called whining. You've probably seen this sort of thing on TV, in the more famous carnival in Rio, or even at the Notting Hill Carnival in London. Many people join bands, each one of which has a theme. For example the sea or jungle fever, and they have costumes designed and made to go with the theme. These can cost a thousand dollars for the king and queen of each band. They're incredible. The whole city is a non-stop party zone, full of colour and sound. It's serious, too. The bands are in competition, and the winner gets a million dollars. Sorry, I got a bit carried away with those memories. Back to my real job there. The orphanage was called St. Augustine's, and that's also the name of the place where it was, St. Augustine, a town just outside the capital city, Port of Spain. I didn't have any particular job description, just to be with the children and tell stories, sing songs and play games. Oh, and we also went camping in the jungle once. <laughs> I could tell you a few stories about that particular escapade. 
Every time I arrived at the gate, kids would come running towards me, shouting, with big smiles on their faces. The younger children seemed fascinated by my blonde hair and loved to touch it as if it was something miraculous. The English teaching I did two days a week in a primary school for six to eleven-year-olds. The kids may have been poor, but they all wore neat and clean uniforms and were so respectful and enthusiastic. I've now been teaching for many years in different countries, and I still think those were the best students I've ever taught. What else did I do while I was there? I swam a lot. Can you imagine what it's like swimming with dolphins and with pelicans diving into the sea right next to you? More seriously, I trained to be a Samaritan. That's someone who listens and supports people who have problems with their lives. Overall, what I took from the experience was a sense of being in another culture, or rather cultures. As humans, we all share many characteristics, but we express ourselves in various ways. In Trinidad, there are lots of different communities and religions, and so many different kinds of festival to see: Hindu, Muslim, Christian, as well as some rather mysterious African traditions. There are quite a few Rastafarians too. Trinidad is, as Americans are fond of saying of their own country, a melting pot. Where everybody is greeted warmly. Go and see for yourself. I'm not sure how it's changed since I was there, but I'd love to find out. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. What would you say, Mr. Murray, are the main reasons that so much of our wildlife will have died out by the end of the next few decades? Well, Tony, we can't, of course, rule out the effect of urbanization due to the spread of population. But apart from that, I believe there are two reasons which. In a way, are like the opposite ends of a piece of string. If you tie a knot in that piece of string, you end up with a circle, and whichever way you go round, it's going to turn out to be the same. I don't think I quite get that, Mr. Murray. Well, let's put it another way. It's rather like a film. You've got the good guys and the bad guys. They're pulling in opposite directions, but when it comes to the final showdown. It's hard to make out which is which. What are your two reasons, Mr. Murray? I call them greed and caring. Greed and caring? Yes, I know they don't seem to have much to do with one another, but think about it. The motive of greed is pretty obvious. In the course of the next few months, thousands of baby seals will be bludgeoned to death before they're even weaned from their mothers. What for? For the sale of their skins at inflated prices to please the vanity of a few, and line the pockets of the killers. Crocodiles will be slaughtered to provide shoes and handbags for the rich. Gorillas, tigers, leopards, and rhinos will be hunted for senseless sport or poached in defiance of regulations. Their skins, their horns, and their magnificent heads will be used as trophies. To decorate someone's living room floor or walls. That's terrible. Yes, but it's not all. The whale, probably the most impressive and certainly one of the most intelligent sea mammals in creation, will be cruelly hunted and harpooned to make more money for the profiteers. The dolphin, the sailor's friend, will be indiscriminately battered to death. At so much a head on the grounds that it is taking away the livelihood of a few fishermen by consuming the fish in its natural habitat. But surely, Mr. Murray, we do have to keep warm. We need whale oil and ambergris. Fishermen have to make a living. Part of what you say is true, of course, Tony, but. We shall have to enforce far stricter controls if future generations are not to find themselves in a world devoid of wildlife as we know it. Well, I see what you mean about fur coats and crocodile handbags, Mister Murray, but I don't understand what you mean by caring. That can't be bad, surely. I mean, 
I thought we were supposed to be living in a caring society. Well, so we do in a way. The trouble is, there are so many well-intentioned people who start out with the best possible motives of trying to protect or immunize us from this, that, or the other in the most effective way, at the quickest possible rate. But in their enthusiasm, they lose sight of the long-term consequences. It's only very gradually that the danger to other forms of life, including humans, comes out. Not to say leaks out, and by that time it'll probably be too late to do much about it. Take insecticides, for instance. But insect. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. But insecticides protect crops from pets. They destroy disease-carrying mites and creepy crawlies like cockroaches. True, but nature has a way of developing her own immunity against insecticides and other pest controls, with the result that the biologists are driven to inventing stronger and stronger compounds, which, though they may annihilate the pest, nevertheless permeate the environment, are assimilated by plant and animal life, and become absorbed by the soil. Countless innocent creatures, the beaver or the mole, for example, are performing a useful task in the natural control. The alarming prospect is that as these poisons enter the foods we eat and consequently our own systems, they'll find their way into the body of the pregnant mother and into her milk, offering incalculable risks to the unborn or newly born infant. In spite of all our technological expertise, our time is running out. We're virtually destroying ourselves. Now listen, and answer questions thirty-one to forty. In my talk today, I'll be exploring the idea of artificial gills. I'll start by introducing the concept, giving some background, and so forth. And then I'll go on to explain the technological applications, including a short, very simple experiment I conducted. Starting with the background, as everyone knows, all living creatures need oxygen to live. Mammals take in oxygen from the atmosphere by using their lungs, and fishes take oxygen from water by means of their gills, which, of course, in most fishes. Are located either side of their head, but human beings have always dreamt of being able to swim under water like the fishes, breathing without the help of oxygen tanks. I don't know whether any of you have done any scuba diving, but it's a real pain having to use all that equipment. You need special training, and it's generally agreed that tanks are too heavy and big to enable most people to move and work comfortably under water. So scientists are trying a different tack. Rather than humans carrying an oxygen supply as they go underwater, wouldn't it be possible to extract oxygen in situ, that is, directly from the water while swimming? In the 1960s, the famous underwater explorer Jacques Cousteau, for example, predicted that one day surgery could be used to equip humans with gills. He believed our lungs could be bypassed, and we would learn to live under water just as naturally as we live on land. But of course, most of us would prefer not to go to such extremes. <laughs> I've been looking at some fairly simple technologies developed to extract oxygen from water, ways to produce a simple, practical artificial gill, enabling humans to live and breathe in water without harm. Now, how scientists and inventors went about this was to look at the way different animals handled this. Fairly obviously, they looked at the way fishes breathe, but also how they move down and float up to the surface using inflatable sacs called swim bladders. Scientists also looked at animals without gills, which use bubbles of air under water, notably beetles. These insects contrive to stay under water for long periods by breathing from this bubble, which they hold under their wing cases.
By looking at these animal adaptations, inventors began to come up with their own artificial gills. Now, making a crude gill is actually rather easy, more straightforward. You take a watertight box, which is made of a material which is permeable to gas, that is, it allows it to pass through inwards and outwards. You then fill this with air, fix it to the diver's face, and go down under water. But a crucial factor is that the diver has to keep the water moving so that water high in oxygen is always in contact with the gill, so he can't really stay still. And to maximize this contact, it's necessary for your gill to have a big surface area. Different gill designers have addressed this problem in different ways, but many choose to use a network or lattice arrangement of tiny tubes as part of their artificial gills. Then the diver is able to breathe in and out. Oxygen from the water passes through the outer walls of the gill and carbon dioxide is expelled. In a nutshell, that's how the artificial gill works. So, having read about these simple gill mechanisms, I decided to create my own. I followed the procedure I've just described, and it worked pretty well when I tried it out in the swimming pool. I lasted underwater for nearly 40 minutes. However, I've read about other people breathing through their gill for several hours. So the basic idea works well, but the real limitation is that these simple gills don't work as the diver descends to any great depth because the pressure builds and a whole different set of problems are caused by that. Research is being done into how these problems might be overcome, but that's another story, which has to be a subject of another talk. <laughs> Despite this serious limitation, many people have high hopes for the artificial gill, and they think it might have applications beyond simply enabling an individual to stay underwater for a length of time. For example, the same technology might be used to provide oxygen for submarines, enabling them to stay submerged for months on end without resorting to potentially dangerous technologies such as nuclear power. Another idea is to use oxygen derived from the water as energy for fuel cells. These could power machinery underwater, such as robotic devices. So, in my view, this is an area of technology with great potential. Now, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yes, um, lady at the... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.